This is the Chris DeGall Show podcast. Okay, guys, let's just rip. And Chris DeGall. Chris DeGall. Chris, thanks for being with me tonight. Chris uh, DeGall. I'm joined now by Chris DeGall. Now. He puts the broad in broadband. It's Chris DeGaulle. The Chris DeGaulle Podcast is presented by USMedicalPlan.com. Save big money monthly and get better health coverage at USMedicalPlan.com. And we like to turn to our favorite Town Hall columnist, senior contributor at Town Hall, author of the prolific Kelly Turnbull series, seven of them all told, all bestsellers, each and every one. Colonel Kurt Schlichter, his latest at Town Hall, they will turn on you. They will turn on you. And we thought, interesting to talk to him today because, um, well, a couple of things. The real news is not, in my view, Donald Trump being indicted because this will be the second of probably four by the time we hit the election next year. The real news is we have uh, a, a president who is clearly on the take to the tune of perhaps tens of millions of dollars along with his son and... Almost no coverage of that today. So we thought we'd reach out to the colonel for his perspective out there on the West Coast. Colonel, ahoy! Ahoy. First of all, uh, I am your favorite town hall columnist. Take that, Larry O'Connor. <laughs> That's right. That's right. No, no, doubt, no doubt about it whatsoever. How you been, my friend? Uh, I'm chilling and ill, and and, uh, pretty soon I'm getting on a plane to go to Hawaii, leaving this hellhole that is California, this place of squatting hobos and, uh, uh, you know, rank communists uh, for the sun and surf and Hawaiian hobos and communists. So I'm I'm, I'm very excited about how this all working out. Your your governor was on with Hannity last night. Did you see any of that? Oh, that idiot. Uh, Which one? I saw about two minutes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're loving Fox, too. You know, I haven't been on Fox since uh, Tucker. I haven't watched it since Tucker, and that's the truth. Um, either, either have I, because, you know, I used to be able to turn on Tucker, and then you have, like, you know, 5 o'clock or whatever my time. I, I, I DVR'd it. You know, I'd eat supper and watch Tucker say things that no one else was saying. And now you get on, and it's like right when Hannity's on. And it's like, Hannity's got the same four guests. Yeah. And it's like, mm, yeah, what's on? <laughs> Nothing. Perhaps I'll have a conversation with my family. So that, uh, You are we're, also, we're you're a, a well-known, highly paid, highly successful attorney, and you know media well. So let me ask you a question about this new, uh, we were just talking about the cease and desist that Fox has fired at Tucker. My understanding <laughs> is... Tucker is being paid by Fox through the end of next year. And so uh, Fox's understanding of their arrangement is if we're paying you, uh, we own you and you don't get to talk anywhere else. So in a court of law, is it your judgment that as long as Tucker's not taking any compensation from Twitter, and I don't believe he is, isn't he free to go there and speak or no? Well, that's certainly his argument. I haven't read the contract. Yeah. Uh, But uh, I do occasionally negotiate contracts for – you know, uh, powerful and potent individuals in the media space. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you have to explain to them, you know, they can sideline you if you accept this deal. Um, but, uh, no, the way he does is, no, I'm just I'm just talking. I, know, I don't have an agreement with uh, Elon. And, you know, Elon's very careful to make sure he, he emphasizes that there is no deal. Now, I, like I said, I don't have any knowledge of what the actual contract says, the language is going to uh, do it, but the, the stuff I have seen is say, you know, you 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 can't have, uh, you know, you can't provide services for somebody else. Well, just getting on Twitter and running your pie hole is not providing services. I know I get on Twitter and run my pie <laughs> hole all the time. Well, that's I'm just intrigued and, because and, and though I'm accused of getting money for my opinions on Twitter, unfortunately, I don't. Yeah, it's funny. Everybody's accused of getting an uh, getting money now. Uh, like if you if you have an opinion, you're being paid. Yeah, you're a shield. You're a grifter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're a grifter. That's uh, not quite my. Fa- like, there, there are a lot of people out there, some kind of generally on our side, who have problems with you know English. Yeah. Um, my favorite are the people who say, "I'll never vote for anybody but Trump. I'll only vote for. I won't vote for a nominee. I'll vote only vote for Trump. And if you won't only vote for Trump, you're a rhino." Okay, not how that works. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree completely. 
Um, it, it, it's like you can have it. I'm not so mad about your view. You choose what you want, but you must speak English correctly. Yeah, and I also think, if I could, I, I do think that there are also some people in our space, uh, if you want to say conservative or whatever, that that are. Um, whose opinions have evolved, and I will just say, I don't think organically. I, I wish everyone would just be per completely <laughs> transparent. You know what I'm saying? Just be transparent. That's all I ask. I don't care. Like, if you're on the team, you're on the team. If you're cashing the check, fine. Just just say it. Like, tell yeah, us what you're up to. There's nothing wrong with it. Look, no. if I, you know, if somebody said, Kurt, I want to bring you on as a consultant for my campaign. Well, I mean, obviously, I'd have to chat with Town Hall about that. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, I, I go, hey, I'm now on, you know, I'm now on the Asa Hutchinson campaign. <laughs> and our new, you know, our, our new campaign motto is Tarnation. Dad gum it. Asa Hutchinson. You Asa know. Hutchinson. In honor of Asa, you may now call me Jebediah. Well, and have you got the, uh, what's, what's that guy up there in, uh, what's his name up there in North Dakota? I've forgotten it. <laughs> The guy in East Dakota. Yeah. Okay. You got the fever for, uh, what's his name? I don't even know his name. I'm on his mailing list now. All of a I sudden. know. It, it, it's like Doug Hamburger. Or yeah. Something. Doug, Doug, uh, yeah, something. Doug something. I, what, what was the thought process? That guy got up in the morning, he, he <laughs> fed his cows, you know. You know, he cleared the snow off his, uh, you know, uh, sod prairie cabin. And goes, you know who could be president? You, <laughs> dadgummit. Uh, I mean, what's the, what's the lane? I, you know, dudes from Fargo? I'm told by people in politics who, you know, consult or run or, or whatever with presidential candidates. I, I am told that all of them legitimately talk themselves into seeing a lane. They, they, they are pay, you know, they, they pay people tons of money to explain to them how it can happen. You know, if a, B and C happens, here's your lane. And then, you know, the political you know, I, consul I, consultant takes the money. I kind of dream of a job where my, my, I get money for telling somebody what he wants to hear, <laughs> which well, no, not really. I don't want to work on the New York times. But <laughs> you get my point. Listen, the political consultant world, uh, I know a couple of them. I know you do too. And it's like, if yeah. you want to talk about money, there's just sick, ridiculous money in that win or lose. That That's the game to be in if you really love politics. Yeah. It, 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 and the thing is, there there seem to be fewer consequences. Like, I'm a lawyer. Yeah. And if you lose, your client gets unhappy. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're, if you're running, And you get a reputation, don't you? Yeah. And if you lose enough in the... Uh, uh, Republican politics, particularly, you eventually get a presidential campaign. <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, look at all, all the guys, you know, all the extra consultants who are now like on MSNBC going, yeah, the Republicans are terrible. Let's turn back the clock to 2003. None of them was like a winner. Colonel Kurt None Schlichter. of them got across the finish line. Your latest piece is they will turn on you. It's a bit dark. I will confess. It's dark. Yeah, it ain't dark. It ain't nice. But, you know, the, the the question is, and, you know, there's always these guys on Twitter going, you guys, with your AR-15s, you, you you can't fight F-15s and drones. You, you know, and, it, and it's like, okay, so you're saying they'll kill us if we don't do what they say. Is that what your, your, your underlying theory? They're like, well, no, you, shut up. But, yeah, um, you look at the FBI guys. I am so sick of people going, you know, the FBI is full of good people. It's just a few bad apples. Where's the good apple? Okay, we know there's like three whistleblowers out of like 17,000 people. Where's the good apples? Because i got to tell you, Chris, you know, I mean, you know, in the Army, back when we had an Army, instead of this woke uh, uh, festival of onanism that we call the military today, I had, you know, we were very much, you know, just following orders doesn't cut it, guys. You have a duty to disobey unlawful orders. You can't, so if your commander says murder all these prisoners, you can't do it and go, well, he told me to. Doesn't work. It's on you. Well, there's a personal responsibility. And, you know, somebody says, okay, everybody, let's, uh, you know, throw on the Kevlar or lock and load those uh, assault rifles and go get that guy who was kneeling at the abortion clinic. You know, that's when Schlichter says, "Yeah, I'm checking out. I'm, I'm not doing that. 
I'm not going to be part of that. And I guess it's going to cost me my pension, but I'm, you know, my, 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 my oath's more important. But you know what? There's always a critical mass of people who are just going to go along. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, that's unacceptable. I don't accept it. And I, I, I think that uh, uh, when push comes to shove, these guys will shove us. And we need to understand that. You walk out in your piece, a place where you believe that the military is full of enough people who will, as you say, follow orders. And and as Biden made clear, I, I point out all the time, Biden gave that very antagonistic screaming speech in front of Independence Hall oh, with yeah. the fiery red behind him. And that's when he said, hey, you, you, you want to talk about your little guns? We've got F-15s. Very antagonistic, very provocative. Like uh, I, that, that it, what? Yeah, it's like what there are they are saying to us there? To there are a couple aspects there. First of all, uh, I think he has the senior officer corps will do whatever and sides with him, mm -hmm. and really uh, is is willing to act on the concept that you know half of America are um, not quite human. They're white supremacists. They're fascists. They're extremists. Whatever. Um, dehumanizing people is the first step to killing them. Uh, <laughs> see Waco. Mm. Um, I, I think for the the difference between the, the rank and file in the military and the FBI, for instance, which is a garbage organization that disgrace itself needs to be disbanded, is that most of the uh, junior people in the military are not as invested because they, they don't feel they're there for a career. They're like me. I went and I did one tour that I went and became a reservist, but it was, I wasn't like invested. It wasn't my pension, right? Yeah. So, you know, if after two years, I was going to get out anyway. You know, you're not, you know, you, you know, if somebody says, okay, roll into town and kill these people. I'm like, oh, that's not going to, you know, I, I better do it if I want to retire comfortably to Boca. <laughs> um, so there, there is there is a difference there. Here's the other thing, and I, you know, people take it wrong, but I'm just I'm just explaining how the world works and how human nature works. Now, you don't have F-15s. Our F-15s will bomb you and, of course, your families. You know, let me ask you as a civilian, what's the most vulnerable part of an F-15? Can you can you tell me that? Mm, do I know most vulnerable part? Uh, it's the family of the freaking pilot. Oh, sure. You know, if you're to a place where you've decided we're going to send the F-15s to go kill the uh, our opponents and, of course, their families, what do you think the opponents are going to do? Hmm. You think they're going to go, wow, you know, there are a bunch of guardrails here. <laughs> you start a dirty war, which is what you start when you start killing American citizens. Um, you're going to get a dirty war. See Ireland, Vietnam. Afghanistan, Iraq, um, and there are a lot more, you know, patriots than F-15s. There's about a thousand. You know, I think I did an analysis once. I think there's like three thousand combat aircraft in the entire U.S. military, of which about two thirds are working at any given time. That's not a lot. Is this? You talk all the time. You you've tweeted for years. Arm yourselves. Buy guns, buy ammunition. You've said that for years. Yes. Is this where your head is? Is this the why? I mean, no. constitutionally? No, 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 no. The, look, for, there are a bunch of reasons to have weapons. First of all, at the most basic level, it is an act of citizenship. It is taking personal responsibility for yourself, your family, your community, and your constitution. The second thing is you have to protect yourself against criminals. The third thing is you have to deter tyrants. And a bunch of guys sitting out there who, who have guns is a big deterrent. Yeah. Right. It, 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 in many ways, unless you are crazy and stupid and evil all at once, in an exponential way, it takes uh, large-scale systematic government violence off the table. It makes it so that even – you've got to be pretty bad to unleash that on people. And, you know, Biden may run his full mouth. I mean, you know, the guy's mind is just basically a giant fungus at this point. But, you know, he's not to the point of sending, you know, an armored division to go, you know, kill everybody in Tulsa. It is really important uh, to underscore this point that you're making. An armed citizenry is what keeps the worst of us in check from doing something 
overly aggressive. That's yes. important. Yes, because because as a, if you're thinking of doing something, you've got to take into account if I push these guys, and you know, if you come and send people to kill me, you're you're pushing me. Yep. Um, there, there's going to be a pushback. There is, right now, we have a political system that is imperfect but works. We have a judicial system that is imperfect but sort of works. Uh, your vote uh, counts, um, unless you're in certain, you know, like Philadelphia. Um, <laughs> there is no moral case for using political violence in America. None. Not, uh, not certainly not uh, on on uh, the, the conservative side. So let's like, start for a civil war. That's stupid, and that's immoral. We are nowhere near that. Having an armed citizenry is to ensure we don't get anywhere near that. Um, no, the, the, we have having the, the answer to resolving our problems is all in that Constitution. You guys in Philadelphia put that together. There's this there's, there's a Constitution there, and all we have to do is do it. And how do we do it? We convince enough of our citizens it's important to do it that they go out and vote beyond the margin of fraud in the places where there are fraud. And we uh, take power and we execute power through the Constitution, within the Constitution. There's the answer. All right. It, 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 there's no it, it, people always want an easy way. They always think, oh, there's some giant referee out there who's going to make things work for us. I, I don't have to go knock on doors or, you know, we're going to we're all going to get our rifles and do something. You know, question one, get your rifles. Question, you know, and, <laughs> step two, question mark. Step three, everything's fine. <laughs> the, the, the answer is to convince more of our citizens to do what we want to do. And it's, of course, that's very hard. Yes. So, you know, the, the, I, I think all the easy answers uh, and, and violence is a, quote, easy answer. It, it, it skips the hard part, which is convincing our fellow citizens. But that's what we've got to do. And that's what he does, at least thrice weekly at townhall.com. His latest is oh, yeah. they will turn on you. He's the colonel. Kurt Schlichter, when do you go to Hawaii, by the way? When are you leaving? Later today. Later, later today. Oh my gosh! And how long are you? How long are you staying? A, a fancy, high-priced lawyer week probably gets so. to stay for like two weeks. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, no, I'll, be there, I'll be there about a week. Nice. I have, I have a lot of plans. Here, here's what they consist of: walk down to a place in the sun near water where guys can bring me drinks. That's my plan. <laughs> and of course, you know, the beautiful arena is all, well, let's see, we need to go here. We need to go to the Dole Pineapple Plantation. And then we need to, I'm like, no, 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 no. She wants I'm to do the things and you just want to sit. I, that's exactly my yeah, wife and I me. I pay my respects at the USS Arizona. <laughs> obviously. Are you taking the but kids? Other than that, I, I'm Chris christie it. Are you taking the kids? I'm taking one of them. Perfect. A good one. That's exactly. If it's perfect, I we're we're taking a, a vacation this this uh, in a couple of weeks. I'm taking one kid myself, not all three, just the one, and that's that's fine. That's plenty. Thank you. Yeah, I'm basically a kid and his buddy, and I'm basically okay. Yes. You guys are free to go. <laughs> Remember, if you call me for bail, I'm going to take about two days. <laughs> Enjoy Hawaii. Uh, what do they say? Mahalo, Colonel. But I, I think that's. Uh, Polynesian for Ahoy. Our chief economist, Steve Moore. He was a former Trump White House economist. Uh, FreedomWorks is where you can find him. And by the way, the, uh, the the newsletter, the daily newsletter is Hotline, the Hotline newsletter from uh, the Committee to Unleash Prosperity. Don't miss it. It's free to sign up. Steve Moore, welcome back, my friend. I have a stack. It's a st I have a money stack of stories. <laughs> I don't know how you well, feel about uh, this. Chris. Chris. Before you get to that, uh, I got the uh, literally 60 seconds ago, the new uh, consumer price index numbers just came out. Okay. So we are at 4.1, a little 4.1 percent inflation now, which is, you know, remember last summer we were at 9 percent. So the inflation rate is coming down. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is, you know, the Fed target is, is 2 percent inflation. So we're still twice as high as where we should be. But we are starting to see some improvement in price increases. Although, you know, when I, you know, go out and see people, people come up to me, they get so angry when they say, how can you say inflation is only four or five or six percent? Because the things that people have to buy yep. 
Chris, you know, groceries or airline tickets or, you know, uh, paying rent or those kinds of things, those prices are way, way up. And so anyway, that's the latest. I just wanted to get that to your listeners, right? It's, it's hot off the presses. So the news is um, inflation has come down. It's still too high, double where it needs to be, according to uh, right. our, our target of 2%. But as you point out, people still feel stretched when they go to the grocery store or whatever. Yeah. So what's the disconnect exactly? Yeah, be- so there is no disconnect. People are stressed, and they should be, because in 21 out of the last 23 months, inflation has run ahead of people's wages, and that continues. So people are getting poorer every month that Joe Biden has been in office, and that's why I thought it was so almost comical that Joe Biden had this big piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, saying, oh, I've conquered all our economic problems, and I'm a savior, and look at all the things I've done. By the way, the latest estimates are that over the last 12 months, Chris, you ready for this one? Over the last 12 months, the United States government borrowed $2.1 trillion, which is the biggest outrage ever. I mean, COVID ended a year and a half to two years ago. We're still borrowing $2 trillion. Why? We should be running surpluses to pay off some of that debt from the COVID crisis, and we're still borrowing like there's no tomorrow. It's a really dangerous situation right now, and there is just no fiscal leadership whatsoever. And even the, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that deal that, you know, I marginally, you kind of yelled at me last week. I was kind of a marginal (laughs) supporter of that. Uh, but it's a bandaid, it's a bandaid on a cancer patient. Yeah. Um, yeah. From from CNBC yesterday, Americans owe nearly one trillion in credit card debt themselves. So never yeah. mind the nation, but yeah. consumers. Yeah, exactly. On average, Americans You're carry good. around five thousand seven hundred thirty three dollars in credit card debt. That's from TransUnion. Yeah. When you break it down by age, yeah. most carry more than that. Those between the ages of forty and forty nine. That's me. Hold an average of seventy six hundred dollars in credit card debt, the highest of any age bracket. Gen Xers can be especially squeezed. Uh, The youngest of the credit card users, 18 to 29, have around 2,900 debt in debt. And that's only because, you know, they're just getting started. So they'll catch up. There's no doubt. But anyway, what do you make of that? A trillion dollars in credit card debt. Oh, it really worries me. And by the way, just for the individual consumer and people out there listening to the show, I mean, don't ring up your credit card debt. That, that's the worst way to borrow, <laughs> Chris. You, yeah. you, you know what's going to charge you on delinquent cr- credit card debt? Yeah, you so, know, they charge you 15, 20, 25 percent. Yeah, it's bad. On that. So it's a, it's a really dangerous situation. And it shows that it, it really confirms what I just said. People are trying to maintain their existing, you know, their, their living standard, you know, which is understandable, but their wages aren't keeping up. So what does that mean? They have to go further into debt to pay their bills and, and to maintain their living standard. And that's why Bidenomics has been such a failure, because it's making people it's driving people further into debt. It's making people it's harder for people to pay their bills. Meanwhile, the United States government debt, you know, two point one trillion dollars. I mean, when I first came to Washington, that was the entire national debt it was two point one trillion. Now we're borrowing two point one trillion a year, folks. This is not a fire drill. This is a crisis. So a couple of days ago, the story was a majority of economists expect the Federal Reserve to pause interest rate hikes for the first time in 15 months. Your read on that, if true. Yeah, I think that's that's right. That's about right. I think they will pause. And uh, how long they'll pause, we'll see. You know, this new inflation report suggests that inflation is coming down. The problem is we're just stuck in a rut right now. We're, you know, it is good news that the official inflation rate is coming down. It's bad news that we're just not seeing, um, you know, growth, prosperity. But, you know, we're not seeing uh, the kind of growth that we had under Trump. Uh, We should be doing much better. And I'm just frustrated. You know, the last six quarters for the last year and a half, you know how much the economy has grown by? A little over more than 1%. That's pathetic. I read a Wall Street Journal piece last week. Headline, get ready for the full employment recession. This is the thing that has been puzzling me, and I've been asking you and asking you for a couple of years, it feels like now. Job growth is soaring, yet output is falling. Blame a historic slump in productivity. 
This yep. is real. I, I have been puzzling over why it's help wanted, help wanted. Everybody's got a job. I told you that people keep telling me, hey, everybody's working. The economy's great. I'm like, no, it's not. It doesn't make sense. I can't explain it. But now the Wall Street Journal seems to be scratching at the surface. We're not, our outcome, say, our, our, produ say, we're not produ our production yeah. is down. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, you know, to describe this economy, we're treading water. You know, that's not growth. And you're right. People are feeling very frustrated. That's why 70 percent of Americans think the economy is headed in the right direction and the country's headed in the right direct, wrong direction because it is headed in the right, wrong direction. You know, it's I've used this analogy before on your show, but, you know, every once in a while I'll go out and, you know, go out with the guys and we'll we'll drink and drink and dance on the tables and, you know, have a great, wonderful hoopla time. And then the next morning, I can't get out of bed. <laughs> you know? So that, that's what that's our economy right now. Everybody knows it. You know, we're dancing on the tables now, but these bills are going to have to be paid. And thirty-two trillion, Chris. All right. You got thirty-two trillion burning a hole in your pocket. I, I, I don't. <laughs> but in my drinking days, I think you and I would have had some fun. That's all I know for sure. Um, <laughs> Steve, Steve, I'm. I have a. I don't do this with you typically. You can pass if you want. You can just say pass and we'll move on. Or you can expound if you want. I have a series of headlines All in right. front of me. They've Go. amassed, so I just thought I'm just going to hit you with them and you respond or say pass. Go ahead. Go ahead. Jennifer Go ahead. Granholm, Go Energy Go Secretary. Ready? Uh, revealed yeah. late last week she has held financial stocks as recently as May, contradicting testimony to the Senate committee earlier this year. So let's just generally talk about Energy secretaries, secretaries of, uh, of the cabinet in general, members of Congress, holding stocks. Uh, your thoughts on that? People in power tied to the markets. For it? Against it? I, I think they, yeah. I think they should put it in a trust. And, and uh, you know, we have a big problem right now because the Biden people who are running these agencies over major uh, industries have no business experience. That's the bigger problem. They don't know what they're doing. An inflation rate continues to hamstring home budgets. Many Americans have turned to e-commerce platforms as a way to gener generate supplement, uh, supplementary income. But an updated provision in the 2021 tax and spend law would devastate the industry next tax season. Uh, Town Hall writes, IRS is overstepping bounds with 1099K reporting rule. Know anything about that? E-commerce. I'm, I'm going to pass on. I'm going to pass on that. I don't know a lot about it. Okay. How about this one? First, it was quiet quitting. Now workers are facing off with their bosses. Half of workers aren't engaging on the job, putting in minimal effort to get by, according to Gallup research. Employee engagement in the United States declined for the second year in a row. There's also a growing share of workforce that is disengaged or resentful that their needs aren't being met. In some cases, workers are disgruntled over low pay, long hours, and have lost trust and their employers. So more and more Americans aren't feeling great about being at work. And then couple that with the number of people, you know, Martha Stewart said last week, she just can't understand yeah. people that you yeah. call up at the uh, call up at home on a Saturday or Sunday and they say I'm busy. I can't talk to you till Monday. Um, she's lamenting, yeah. you know, working from home two or three days a week and that people's attitudes about work are like don't bother me till I'm in the office. Your thoughts? That's yeah, a culture it, thing it, maybe. It, 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 yeah, it's it's the productivity issue you just mentioned. Yeah. You know, those are just examples of where American workers becoming kind of soft. And by the way, we're we're you know, competing now, folks, with the Chinese workers. You think they're they've got that attitude? Yeah. Yeah. No, she she's right. We're becoming France. I mean, Western Europe, if you visit it, it's yeah. like everything's yeah. about siestas and closing on Tuesday and not opening till two in the afternoon. Yeah. And it, that's what they do over there. Oh, there's now talk of about a four day work week you know, 32, 30 hours a week, you know, and, and even the, you know, I mentioned this to you last week that the work requirements in the, uh, in the debt bill for people on welfare are 20 hours a week, Chris. Yeah. How many people are only working 20 hours a week? Come on. That's ridiculous. I mean, if you're on welfare, you should work a full-time job. Katie Pavlich. In, in, in exchange for the benefit. Yes. Katie Pavlich at Town Hall. The FBI bank scandal just expanded. Bank of America may not be the only financial institution voluntarily turning over mass amounts of customer data and transaction history to the FBI around January 6th. Um, this goes on to talk about banks just handing customer data over to uh, the feds. Your thoughts, if you have any. I know that may not be your wheelhouse. but Here's the hell Scares that you? scares the hell out of me. Yeah. You know, where's your privacy? Where's your financial privacy? When these private uh, companies are turning over your private financial data to the government and the IRS, that's an outrageous. What are we, the Soviet Union now? 
JP Morgan to pay $290 million to settle Jeffrey Epstein accuser's suit. Agreed $290 million to su- settle a lawsuit over its ties to Jeffrey Epstein, JP Morgan. Yikes. That's a stunning. Woo. Like that's <laughs> I didn't I don't think I understood exactly what they felt their connection was or maybe they're just settling to make it go away. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the exact details of that, but what was the number again? Two hundred ninety million. The lawsuit was brought by an unnamed accuser who claimed the bank ignored red flags about Epstein until twenty thirteen because he was bringing wealthy clients to the bank. J.P. Morgan has denied any wrongdoing, but said, "Okay, okay, wow. here's two hundred ninety million. Leave us alone." Yeah, it's it sounds like they're you know just paying off to get get them <laughs> off their back. You know? Man, here's my favorite story. Why the rise of electric vehicles has some fearing blackouts. Politico, of all places, is writing this. Automakers and utilities are going to have to interact in ways they didn't have to before, in ways that aren't comfortable. The rise of electric vehicles creating an urgent need for auto and power industries to develop a closer relationship. I've said this and said this and screamed this. If we're all driving these stupid electric vehicles, Steve, where the hell is the energy going to come from to power them all? Oh, that's a very inconvenient question you're asking, but I'm not the right person to ask that. Will you ask that to Joe Biden or Jennifer Granholm? I mean, they, what do they think that, the, you know, what are we going to put? Put windmills on the top of cars? Perpetual motion machines. I did used to call myself the wind czar. My patented wind, uh, my wind bag. I called it the wind bag. You could just strap it to the hood of your car lawnmower and wait for the, a, a stiff gust of wind and off yeah. to the races. Uh, all right, Chris, I have one for you on, on the way out. Okay. The amount of of uh look um the amount of carbon dioxide that has been emitted into the atmosphere Mm -hmm. from these forest fires did you know forest fires are one of the leading causes of um causes of uh of carbon dioxide i I, know that i don't guess i do did but it would make sense yeah so here's my point you know, rather than shutting down the entire U.S. energy industry, rather than having, uh, you know, uh, telling people they can't buy cars, rather than telling people, you know, they can't have gas stoves and stuff, why don't we just do something about forest management and we could we could prevent, you know, a third of all the, the uh, carbon emissions? That, maybe that's just too logical, right? S- Smoky Bear, only you can prevent forest fires. That's the campaign. All right, my friend. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Steve-O. Good to catch up. Donald Trump. And it's and his campaign, um, according to Fox News report, they brought in six point six million dollars in fundraising since yesterday. <laughs> and of course, he's already I mean, from the first indictment, he's already selling merchandise, which was my prediction. As you remember, I predicted that they were going to put Trump mug shots on mugs and T-shirts, and they did. Um, You know, from a communications point of view i really have puzzled over this so we bring in one of the great communicators um in conservative politics sean spicer who was the former white house press secretary uh his beyond the briefing podcast as well as his brand new youtube launch uh which is growing by leaps and bounds if you haven't watched him on youtube yet you've got to start go to youtube.com slash sean m spicer that's how you find him and Sean, I welcome you in, my friend. I've been puzzling and puzzling over this. These poor Republicans, and I mean this sincerely. I'm not. I'm not mocking it. I like if you if you want to challenge Donald Trump and you want to become the next nominee to challenge Biden, I I don't know how you cut through this. I don't. Is it even possible? I heard Dick Morris say you can't. It's over. Trump's the nominee. Do you agree? Good morning. Good morning, Christopher. Always good to be with you. Uh, look, I I think. I've been saying this for a while. I mean, he is the de facto nominee for a variety of reasons, both politically in terms of his standing, but then I, I've always maintained this, and this is where I think a lot of pundits don't fully appreciate the, the game here, is mechanically. And what I mean by that is that Trump has run twice before. He owns more data and insight into the Republican field, particularly in the early states than anyone else. Data, political data, like any data, I mean, if you wanted to start up, a firm and you were looking for some marketing materials to figure out who exactly your customers are, that costs money. Uh, Trump's run twice before, so he understands that. He's got the connections. He knows the precinct chairman, all that kind of stuff. It just takes time and money to get all that, which he has. Um, So I agree with that. Now, to answer the second question, I will say this. I've been very clear that if you are going to beat Trump, the only way 
uh, is if somebody can be take one or two of the first four early states, New Hampshire, uh, Iowa, South Carolina, Nevada. And, and the reason is, is that you need to be able to show donors and activists that you can actually take down the king. If he runs the first four states, there's no one, rich people don't throw good money after bad. Uh, people don't get out of bed early on a Saturday morning to go put up signs for a loser. And so I, I think if you're gonna beat him, it's gotta happen. Uh, early and it's got to show people, hey, I got a shot at this. All that being said, let me finally get to your answer here. Um, I think the only person that I see quasi, and I would say, you know, kind of do this somewhat effectively is DeSantis because he is at least making the case that he is more conservative yes. than Trump. And at least there are voters that say, you know, at the end of the day, and DeSantis is talking about like the first step back and things like, was that really conservative or was that, you know, Ivanka Trump? Um, and he's trying to peel off some of these folks on a pol on a conservative ideological basis. I don't know that there's enough road to hoe there, but I do know that that's the only way that's going to work because the way that these guys like, you know, Mike Pence and Nikki Haley, I, I mean, I look at this and I'm like, who is advising you? <laughs> because I, I find it, I, I mean, I honestly, I've said this before, I think some of these people are running for a cable contract, not running to be the nominee. <laughs> Sean Spicer with us. Follow him on YouTube. You get great analysis. Sean's doing deep dive analysis like this. Uh, for the next 18 months, he's one of these go-to places, I mean, for, for the, the very best insight, because he's been inside the RNC, he's certainly been inside the White House, he's been inside national campaigns, so he knows this stuff like the back of his hand. And you'll get this analysis all year long at uh, YouTube uh, and Sean's channel. Uh, so DeSantis, and you and I think I've spoken about this before, they believe, as you said, that they have the more credible angle on pure, raw culture, cultural conservatism. And I think that's true. And the question is, though, it's interesting because a guy like Paul Ryan was on CBS uh, this week. And I think yeah, we have that. that. This is amazing. Let me play this clip again for people that missed this. Paul Ryan doesn't realize what he just said here, uh, because if you believe what Paul Ryan believes, he's actually endorsing Trump, which I know is the last thing he'd ever admit. But listen to a little of this and then I'll get your reaction. Can I get your thoughts on that movement just quickly? I know we have to go, but Republican lawmakers around the country are pushing legislation when it comes to banning books. Um, it could be trans rights, call it anti-woke, or however you want to label it. Is that a good approach, a good strategy? You're a football fan. Is that the way you should approach it? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a culture war guy. Uh, I think it's really polarizing. Look, I, I, on some of these issues, I'll side uh, you know, with the anti-woke crowd, but to me, I'm worried about a debt crisis. I'm worried about you know, the future of our country and, and China. There are big policy problems that we need to tackle if we want to have a great 21st century for this country. Um, my work at AEI Notre Dame and my Poverty Foundation is all about poverty and upward mobility. You know, what I worry about are the big policy challenges that are going unresolved or made worse by Joe Biden. OK, so that's so why I want to. You win. get it. I'm not a culture war guy, says Paul Ryan. I was like, <laughs> OK, Paul. Um, so I like I'm very intrigued by that. I, I often hear from sort of center right people. They don't like the culture stuff. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm confused, Sean, is what I'm bottom line saying here. Well, no, no. Can I just say you shouldn't be confused if we don't have a culture, we don't have a country. Right. I mean, so so you should. I mean, if you if you don't want to take up a position in the culture war, then then I don't think you get it. Exactly. Because that's what the left is fighting. I mean, that, that the problem is we didn't start this quote unquote culture war. Bingo. They did. Right. And so if you are complete, you, you are complicit if you don't do anything. And that's the problem is that I fundamentally find that shocking. And I, I mean, I know Paul always talks about, you know, he's a policy guy. But that's the point. Policy is driven by culture. You you have tax policy to keep a family together, to promote family or promote home ownership. That's culture. Yes. Right. So the, the, the policy is driven by the culture that you want to create or maintain. And if you can't, if you say, I'm not I'm not into the culture war, then what are you fighting for? Why are you? I mean, he just talks about poverty. Right. Yeah. And he wants to alleviate poverty. I don't know much about his center, but I'm assuming based on Paul's background, that his center is about getting people out of poverty and not addicted to the government, right? To what the left is. Well, that's culture. I mean, there, there is a culture that, that the Democrats and the left perpetuate that says that the government is the answer to everything and the government housing and government assistance. The, the other culture, which is what I believe, I think you believe, is that 
we should provide for, for those less fortunate, those of less means, to give them the resources to succeed and, and not be addicted to government. And so that is the culture. And if you don't get it, then I think that's part of the problem. Are you making an argument then for DeSantis? Because I, I have to I have to say, um, while I voted for Trump twice and I have said pretty clearly, I feel at this point now and I th- I'm, I'm very I'm intrigued because even people that aren't nuts about Trump are starting to come home to this idea of we can't abandon him now because of what he's going through. Right. He, it's like this ultimate rallying cry for him. However, I have to hand it to DeSantis it's not even close. When it comes to these actual cultural fights that we're talking about, DeSantis has the resume over Trump on that. I really do believe that. You? Well, I mean, it's different. I mean, he had a, a Republican supermajority legislature in Florida that allowed him to do a lot of things that Trump put, couldn't do, even with the, the smaller Republican majority that he had in the Congress. So I, I don't think it's an apples to oranges. Constraint. I will say that, like, look, here's the reality. I, I First of all, I... I believe that Donald Trump understood what it took to go in and shake up Washington. Yes. Number one. Number two, it wasn't talk. We are so people don't understand who are not conservatives because I hear this from all the time from people in the press. Like, you know, this politician said this. I'm like, exactly. They said it. And that's the thing that people don't get is that what Trump did is he didn't just say he delivered. He didn't take no for an answer. He didn't take the status quo for an answer. And I think it takes somebody to do that. Now, if, if Ron DeSantis is the nominee, I would be happy to vote for him. I think yep. he's a great guy. I think he's smart. I think he's ideological. Like I have no problem with him. Um, but I do think that uh, if Trump can get in there and finish the job, that's great. And like I said, I look at this more uh, from an analyst perspective, sort of uh, agnostic, where I say, look, explain to me how Ron DeSantis becomes the nominee. Right. Because right now, I don't. I mean, Trump's leading by thirty points in uh, thirty plus points in in Iowa. He's up in New Hampshire. He's up in Nevada. Up in South Carolina. If he runs the first four, as I said, it's over. So I've said this before. If DeSantis can pick off one of the early states, I think we're going to have you know one of the, a, a real race. But until that happens, I, it's all, not. It isn't. All so, he needs is one. All DeSantis needs to do is pick off one to make a case. Well, I, I think I think one. If I were his team. I, he's all in in Iowa. I think he has to win Iowa, and I think he has to be strong in in New Hampshire. And what I mean by that is, if you come in second and it's you know Trump gets fifty one percent and you get twenty two, that's not strong. I mean yeah. that's that's you're technically second. I think if if Trump gets forty two and you're at thirty nine, people are going to go, hey, this guy actually can do it. But I think you know the 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 beauty of our early state process on the Republican side, one that Joe Biden got scared of, is that. There is a little bit of diversity. Iowa, you have to go there. You have to campaign in person. It's very retail oriented. Uh, obviously, the same in New Hampshire. I'm not trying to dismiss that, but in Iowa, because of the caucus system, you really have to own that. Sean, I was told um, by a DeSantis. Then, I was told by a DeSantis guy he cannot. Trump cannot win New Hampshire. The DeSantis people are confident Trump cannot win New Hampshire. Do you agree or disagree? I totally disagree. Yeah. I mean, look at look at. I mean, Chris Sununu, the governor. Uh, was only getting 14% there, and Chris Sununu is a very popular uh, governor there in New Hampshire. I mean, I, I don't know. Absolutely not. Okay. I don't, I don't I, as I said, if I did, my analysis would be different. But but Trump, look, can, 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 can he lose? Yes. But right now, he is the presumptive favorite in every one of these states. I think it's an interesting thing, uh, and I came across it yesterday, wanted to run it by you. Clay Higgins, a Republican out of Louisiana at a House Oversight Committee, said this this week, uh, my fellow conservatives, the DOJ and FBI doesn't expect to imprison Donald Trump, but they do expect to imprison you. They want a January 6th all over again in Miami, in your city and in mine. They want MAGA conservatives to react um, and in doing so, set yourselves up to be targeted for persecution and further entrapment. They want to intercept busloads of conservatives en route to protests and create conflicts during stops. They're hoping to provoke conservative Americans. Don't fall for the trap. Maintain your family. Live your life. Live free and pay close attention. Make your voice heard, but don't become an incarcerated pawn in the agenda-driven DOJ FBI strategy to oppress conservatives across America. Agree, Sean Spicer? Uh, partially. Um, I, I, I Are we being that, baited here? In other words, provoked and baited. Well, I, I think that, like, look, I, I think Trump's got a huge point about the selective prosecution from the DOJ. You think about it; they didn't go after. I mean, I was thinking about this this morning before I came out with you. But it's like Trump talks about the fact that that Comey, Clinton, and Biden all broke the law with respect to classified information, and it's, it, that's not even 
disputable. Like the, the the law says, you can't handle it or possess it in certain ways. They did. That's a that's a no brainer. Um, but then I started to think about it. it. Goes beyond that. I mean, you think going back to the BLM riots, how many people got away with that? How many people went and broke the law by protesting in front of uh, um, the, the Supreme Court justices' homes? I mean, the list goes down and down. And people who do things on the left just don't get prosecuted anymore. I mean, how many places have been looted and and it's like all in the name of of you know some kind of trans rights or black lives matter and it's okay it's, if you do that now if you do something on the right you're going to be prosecuted and go to jail and i think that there is an aspect of that that we're seeing more and more yeah. um so sean i'll i guess i'll close by asking you do you think i mean i was reading T turley's piece earlier this morning and talking about these charges everybody thinks the espionage act at least everybody who i've heard that i respect turley um people like levin espionage is heavy-handed and outrageous do you is there a possibility here that Donald Trump goes to prison? And is there any scenario you get there? And if so, is it before the election? Let me take that in order uh, backwards. I don't think it happens before the election. Um, just because I think that that the timing's just not going to work. And I'm not a lawyer, but I just even on my back of the envelope map, I go, OK, if this went to trial, then. So. Um, so, no, I do think it's possible. Look, I, and I think anyone's kidding themselves if they don't think that, that it's possible that you can find a judge or a jury that will convict Trump. I've heard everyone say it the opposite. Oh, there's no way in 12 people that he would. Listen, I, I've been in various cases, um, involved in various cases since Trump became president. Um, and I will constantly ask the lawyers and say, hey, I don't get this. How is this possible? Because, you know, this happened in South Dakota and it's being handled in you know virginia and they're like yeah it shouldn't be and i'm like well okay what do you, i don't get this i'm not a lawyer to explain they're like yeah a lot's changed since trump's become president just judges have become more activists they're reinterpreting the laws uh they're giving instructions that shouldn't have been and i'm like wow mm. so i say that because i want people to understand that like as somebody who has now had to be involved in a lot of different disputes it it, it troubles me what the the law how the law is being interpreted by people who just don't like donald trump yeah so that's number one and so i do think there is a possibility now here's to the nut of your question why i don't think he'll go to jail ultimately i think if biden or any other democratic president uh, was in office and i'll say this here to you today so that we have the tape of this i believe that what would happen is that if he does if he were to ever be convicted which i don't think he would be just so your audience is clear on this but god forbid he was I believe that the, whomever the Democratic president was at the time would commute his sentence, but not pardon him. So they would say, we're not going to take the stigma off of him uh, for what he did, but we are going to commute the sentence because we don't think it looked good for a sitting president in a democracy to be sitting in jail for some kind of ridiculous crime. Because remember, there is no evidence or no allegation that anything that Trump did has put our national security at stake. None. I mean, you could say it could have, might have, possibly would have. That's all possible. So is the case of Biden and Clinton in particular. Uh, so, you know, there's no case that that's happened. That's something. Um, I, we, we'll file that away, Sean Spice. And of course, if Trump should be um, victorious, he's the nominee. He takes on Biden. He wins and becomes president again. He um, he, pardons he pardons himself, himself. <laughs> which is I, I think is the it, it like. It's the end of a Netflix series is really what that is, if that actually happened. But, Sean, um, this is why people need to watch your YouTube channel now. That's what you're doing these days is offering this analysis. Yes? Yes. Sean M. Spicer on YouTube. Uh, if you go to Locals, you can help me build this brand new show that's coming out in August. It's seanspicer.locals.com as well. We will keep watch and stay in touch and value your input throughout this mess. Thank you, Sean. The Chris DeGall Show Podcast.